and you're at a session called Anti-Racism Plus. And let me explain a little bit of the genesis of this and then introduce our wonderful presenters and kind of the structure of this so that um, you're very clear on what it is that you're going to be doing today. So the, the genesis of this really was gender equality space. We have a problem, we do. Feminism doesn't address intersectionality well. They don't really know what it is. Everyone's kicking the word around. And as far as anti-racism, it really, it, racism really exists just in a vacuum. It's tied up with gender, socioeconomic status, all of these intersecting inequalities. And so from my perspective, and I can only see the world really from my own perspective, I can try to see other people. I can be sympathetic, which is what I'm asking everyone here to do. But my own experience is I'm a child of immigrants. I'm a first generation American first in my family to go to college. And everything by all accounts on paper should be fine, right? But what happens is even when you're in these spaces, you don't leave all of that behind. And the structure that set up the inequality follows wherever you go. You can say that this is a safe space, but is it really? And so to that end, you look at someone like me, you think she should have very relatively few problems, but Let's look at women exactly like me. Moving forward in the workplace, um, the, high, the more education you have, ironically, the gap between your salary and a white woman's salary gets exponentially larger. So that is in itself strange. Um, maternal health, we had a session on that yesterday. Regardless of your socioeconomic status, if you are a black or brown woman um, in a Western country, you are almost, um, it is almost an, a near impossibility that you would receive um, equitable medical care. And so all of these things are in fact women's issues, but they're not being taken up. We're not having honest conversations about the structural racism that exists within ourselves, all of us, and within our organizations. And I can tell you from my own experience, I've had lots of conversations with like-minded people and we see it and we believe in gender equality, but there is a gap. And so in order for our work to have more resonance, it's important that we not just incorporate this, but make this central. So you have perceptions of black and brown women compared with their counterparts in the world that we're trying to change, but this also exists in gender equality. You may have noticed, or you may not have noticed that a lot of the organizations, the majority, the overwhelming majority of the organizations that are being called out in the international development sector for racism, they're not uh, health organizations, they're not education organizations, they're gender equality organizations. We have a problem. And so to that end, we really have to do something because our work is being impacted. And if we, if we are seeking to realize what we first imagined in Beijing 25 years ago, and even prior to that, a truly equal world, then we have to advocate for all women. And this is a glaring problem. And now we're at a space in time, we're at a space in consciousness where we can actually start to unpack some of those things. So there's so many different inequalities. There's Islamophobia, there's xenophobia, there's anti-Blackness, there's LGBTIQ, there's all of these types of inequalities. And this stuff that we're gonna get in today, it's messy, it's complex, but it is imperative. And so it's gotten to a point where even within Black feminism, which I'm quite familiar with, Black feminists are now not calling themselves feminists anymore. They're calling themselves womanists to separate themselves from the racism of this movement. And that's a shame. We need everybody on deck. We need everybody working towards the same cause. We're not gonna always agree on everything. But what we do have to agree on is that we're fighting inequalities that affect all, that affect women, all of the inequalities. So they're different from woman to woman but we're fighting for all of them. And so there are a couple of things that I wanna make clear about this space as we've imagined it. First, yes, I did share a little bit of my personal story, but if you notice, I didn't go into it in a huge amount of detail. We breeze, personal stories are powerful and they're everywhere. And it's a matter of looking for them when you wanna find them. This presentation, this session is going to focus more on the structural problem of racism. And we're going to look at it as not just an interpersonal problem, because that is part of it, but we will address it in a way that we start to unpack the power dynamics underneath it so that we can dismantle it 
not only within ourselves, but within our organizations and more largely within our sector. And so the way that this is structured is that you're going to hear from each of our presenters. Um, they're all wonderful and you will, you will share this opinion once you've heard them speak. We will delve into topics like Islamophobia, xenophobia, intersectionality and feminism, epistemic privilege and whiteness in the development sector, analysis of power dynamics and anti-blackness, which I just spoke about. You'll hear from the presenters and then we're gonna go into, instead of breakout groups, we're gonna call them breakthrough groups, where it's a free flowing conversation with only two asks. The first ask is, what are you going to do? What would you like to do to unpack the structure of racism in your organization? And the second part of that question is within yourselves. You can share it or you cannot share it once we come back together. We realize in some cases, this is a very personal and non-linear process. So those who are comfortable sharing, please do. And those who don't, don't feel obligated to share. Our goal is for you to leave with a tenet or promise to yourself, not even to us, to yourself, holding yourself accountable, what you will do to combat racism in your organizations and in yourselves. So I have spoken long enough, um, but I will lay out a few quick rules and then I'll go into the bios of our presenters. First, trauma sharing is optional. You don't necessarily have to share your trauma if you're not comfortable with it. Two, the voices of the marginalized regarding their experience take precedence. When it comes to someone's own personal experience, it's not a debate. Um, also, please no white tears or experience centering and all anti-racist points are valid. There's different ways to do this. There's my way, there's someone else's way. That's why I say this is a very personal process. But all that being said, this is a co-creation space. We are co-curating, we're co-creating. So your own tenet is the result of your own learnings from your breakthrough. You own that, it's yours. No one's telling you what you should do. This is what you're comfortable doing. And as a result of this, what you will do moving forward to eradicate racism in yourselves and in your organization. And put on your structural hat. Let's all pretend to be sociologists and look at structures as opposed to the personal only. Both of those are our components of racism. And we certainly have the right people to walk you um, down this road and take this journey. So with no further ado, I'm going to read the bios of our wonderful uh, presenters. And if you could just wave your hand so everybody knows, I mean, obviously your name is there, but if everybody knows who you are, that would be great. And then we will go into presentations. So our first presenter will be Isma Ben Bulerba. She's a strong and passionate feminist activist and has been working for years to end harmful practices and sexual gender-based violence. She was born and raised in France from migrant Algerian parents who grew up during the French colonization. After several years of professional experience in France, West Africa, and with women from the Arab Muslim diaspora and FGM affected communities in Europe, Isma has built up important knowledge on sexual and reproductive rights, gender-based violence, harmful practices around the bodies of women and girls, and particularly on female genital mutilation and virginity testing. She works at NFGM EU as coordinator of programs and sits on the board of decolonizing contraception as an advisor. Uh, she also is representing UACT, a European youth network for sexual and reproductive rights, where she works as a network coordinator, a network that gathers more than 30 SRHR activists in more than 10 European countries. Thank you, Isma. Zenia Kellner, um, she's my cell sister at this point. <laughs> um, she's, she always got it. And I was so thrilled when she and I came together and, and cooked up this, this session. She has a background in international law, human rights, European and international criminal law. She specialized in women, peace and security, as well as combating human trafficking, a field which she worked for, worked in, excuse me, for years at the KFN with a focus on cross-border investigations and cooperation in Europe. She previously studied law in Mexico and worked for CLADEM in the field of VAW, focusing on the issue of femicide and the monitoring and implementation of CEDAW in the aftermath of the Cottonfield case. In her work, she focuses on multi-layer approaches for systemic and transformative change and fostering inclusive feminist leadership towards gender equality. She is also a valued member of the Civil Society Advisory Group, 
and is a co-founder and lead of the advocacy team at Young Feminist Europe. And like I said, she is my intersectional soul sister. So if you can wave, Ksenia. Um, yes. And then we have Bruna Martinez, SRHR and gender specialist. Bruna is an intersectional feminist and holds a master's degree in development studies from the International Institute of Social Sciences in The Hague. Her work has been focused on pro-choice advocacy and social justice with a keen focus on community building, meaningful youth participation, and strengthening the linkages between the SRHR and HIV. Please uh, acknowledge yourself, Bruna. Vera Mistri is a researcher, development professional, and intersectional feminist from India. She has a master's degree in development studies from the International Institute of Social Sciences at The Hague, and is pursuing her second master's in international relations and global governments and at Ramon Lull University in Barcelona. Through her work in social justice, gender, and youth development, she looks to address and unpack structures of power and find solutions for, meaning, for meaningful, sustainable change. And last but not least, Solange Mohosa is a feminist activist, policy and research specialist, and a member of Young Feminist Europe. She is a graduate in political science with a specialization in European affairs, who's very interested in gender equality. She wrote her master's dissertation on Belgian feminist organizations that allowed her to acquire even more knowledge on the gender gap in different areas, pay gap, underrepresentation of women in media and political spheres, et cetera. She's always centered her research on women's empowerment initiatives, diversity, and inclusion. Please welcome Solange. With that being said, I will turn the floor gladly over to Isma, who will be our first presenter. Thank you very much, Isma. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Trisha. I'm just gonna wait for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trisha. Thank you everyone for, uh, for joining today. And thank you for Xenia, to Xenia because she, she thought about me for this uh, wonderful panel. Um, so as Trisha said, we're gonna be talking about different forms of, of racism and my presentation is gonna be focused on Europe. It doesn't mean that what I'm gonna present doesn't exist elsewhere, it absolutely exists. However, it is very well Europe-focused. Europe so um, let's start. So to begin, slide. I'm just gonna ask you two questions. Just think about them. We're not gonna have like a Q&A session right away. So do we all experience pain the same way? And do people of colors feel less pain? And, I'm, and I know like you're wondering, what is she talking about? What is happening here? And this is what we're gonna be talking about slide. So it's very important when we talk about the Mediterranean syndrome to understand what is happening in Europe within our health systems. So here are just a few uh, common uh, and very racist thoughts that many, many people of colors have experienced in Europe when going to the ER, going to the hospital, or going to just see a doctor. The main, the first one is that Black people have thicker skin. All of these thoughts just before um, going further are things that I found online on many, many Instagram pages or things that some of my friends told me. So those sentences are not made up. It is true. Some people felt them, had them, uh, doctors telling them to, telling that to them. North Africans have diabetes because they drink mint tea. Women of colors are drama queens. Roma people are not really sick. They just want to see patients and sell the medications they will receive. Women wearing hijab will always refuse to be treated by a male doctor because their husbands won't accept it. People of colors don't need a lot of medication. It's okay, they're just exaggerating. Asian people are quite patient. They don't really complain. And black North African people, patients are so loud. I just wanna say that I'm completely disgusted by, with myself just repeating this, but it's important for you to be aware of these examples. All of these things exist. Many other examples exist. And this is the set some sentences were told to me when going to the hospital, for instance. It's a slide. So am I saying that hospitals are racist? And the answer is yes, I am, absolutely. 
because we have to understand that we live in a patriarchal and racist system everywhere in the world. So it means that everything that is linked to this system is also patriarchal and racist. So it means that in our societies, because the government is racist, because the power, everything is racist, it means that health systems, education, everything that is linked to the system is also racist. We know for a fact that racial disparities in healthcare are a reality. We also know that many times, in many occasions, we see that doctors are being biased and that they have had during their trainings um, biased judgment transmitted to them. And this is called the Mediterranean syndrome. So what is the Mediterranean syndrome, basically? A slide. So the Mediterranean syndrome is called like this uh, because in Europe, uh, around the 40s, 50s, and 60s, many North Africans and many Black people were, went to, to Europe. And just to call them the best way, they just said Mediterranean people. So we're talking about people of colors here. Apparently, one of the major ideas that anthropology and anthropologists found out was that many doctors think that Mediterranean people are less resistant, that they feel pain, pain less importantly than white people, or that they feel it differently. Um, and apparently, Arab, Black, and non-white populations tend to express their pain more openly, if not exaggeratingly. So this is absolutely racist, of course. And those are stereotypical ideas towards non-white people while receiving health care. And it's a very important to understand that it means that doctors are not trained to understand that ways to express pain are very much linked to how your culture lets you express pain. Um, and that is important that things like saying that an Asian person is not feeling pain because they're quiet is racist and they shouldn't say these things. Slide. It's important to understand that in Europe, you can't, we don't have enough data collected based on race because it is not mandatory and because in many countries it is considered as illegal. In France, if you are a person of color, your document when you go to the ER is gonna be color blinded. You have your name, your identity, your gender, but no one is going to add also your origins or what, how doctors are going to perceive you. We have few data existed that exist on non-white uh, patients receiving healthcare. In France, in 2018, we tried to have like a survey um, that was only replied by two thousand and twenty-two people. That is not recognized by the French government, just to kind of give them a space to share what happened to them, what happened to people of colors while going to the ER or while trying to have the best healthcare possible. Slide. So yes, when it comes to Mediterranean syndrome, we have a lot of barriers, we have a lot of obstacles. And this is just a nutshell of what is actually the Mediterranean syndrome. The first one is language barrier. We tend to think that because you do not speak perfectly, fluently, like French, English, Dutch, Italian, whatever, you're not, you're an ignorant, which is not the case. Migrant people are fluent in many languages. Um, why doctors are not also fluent in different languages? Why do we force um, people to try and speak in the language where they're not comfortable uh, talking in? We have also a lot of cultural barriers. Um, again, we have to understand that expressing pain varies from a person and another and from a culture to another. Patient's appearance, we shouldn't judge again a patient based on the way they dress or the way they have their body language or, or on the way that they just are waiting to receive proper health care. Again, we should also judge on social economical status and this is all of this thing happen in medical systems. Institutional discrimination in healthcare should be recognized so that we can properly fight it. And, and then we need to train professionals, health professionals against race biased care because it happens because we know that some doctors trained other doctors with these uh, stereotypical ideas and racist thoughts. Um, slide. So you have many reading suggestions. I just selected a few of them. I really invite you just to Google uh, Mediterranean syndrome and you will be very impressed uh, with everything that you're gonna find. And my deep thoughts go to Naomi Musenga, who was 
um, a victim of uh, a Mediterranean syndrome situation and died in 2018 because the ER people laughed at her and didn't acknowledge that what she was experiencing was a heart attack. So slide. Thank you very much to everyone. I'm happy to have this, the other part of this, uh, uh, this, the other part of this conference to really talk a little bit more about Mediterranean syndrome and to hear from you. So thank you all very much, and over to you, Tricia. This month, thank you very much for that extremely thorough and extremely thoughtful uh, presentation. And we're going to hold all of the questions for everybody um, that is in the chat. I see the chat's very lively. Um, we're going to hold it until the end. We want to get through all the presentations and then the breakthrough sessions because some of your questions may be answered in the breakthrough sessions. And our next presenters will be Bruna Martinez and Vida. The floor is yours. Hi, thank you, Tricia. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm so sorry, but I'm having connectivity issues, so I'm going to keep my, my video off. But I think you have a representation up, so that's not so much of a problem. Um, yes, thank you very much, Olivia. Um, today, Vera and I wanted to talk to you about something that is very, very close to our hearts, which is epistemic privilege and whiteness. You know, as uh, feminists and young researchers working in the development sector, we are often interrogating what are the intricacies between colonialism and racism in academia and civil society organizations still today. So questions as who has the space to speak up and actually be heard? What are the voices that we are often quick to dismiss? And who are the ones that we pay attention to? Why? Finally, what are the underlying power dynamics and structures that makes the word praise Greta, a white Swedish girl, but at the same time, keep silencing the voices of other young indigenous activists that are also fighting um, for environmental justice. The fact that center groups and identities are still kept on the margins and being silenced is precisely why true feminism and gender equality activism is only revolutionary if it's intersectional and anti-racist. I mean, think about it. For the first time, CSW NGO is having an anti-racist space. With, it's a truly wonderful progress and we welcome it, but isn't it a bit too late considering that it's 2021? Knowledge is power. Knowledge production is power. Power to control the narrative, power to create the stereotypes and the bias as Isma was just talking about, power to think of oneself as objective, as the standard, as the norm power to ultimately maintain the status quo. So recognition of the image that you have on in front of you, let me quickly tell you a story of uh, slave Anastasia. Uh, I didn't know this until I was 25 years old researching for my, my, my master's on the voices countering patriarchal whiteness in Brazil. But slave Anastasia has became has become a, a big symbol of, of resistance in the black community in Brazil. In the beginning of the last century, she was forced to wear this mask uh, because she would confront uh, her masters and also because uh, the stories vary, but also because she would deny uh, when her white master would try to enforce herself upon her. This is what the well, Black Feminist Scholarship in Brazil now calls the mask of silence. The mask itself is a concrete uh, representation of the white cis heteronormative male power, the power of whiteness. And let me be clear here, I'm not talking only about white people, I'm talking about a structure, as Trisha has, has mentioned, that uh, more often than not has other groups has colorisms, has so many forms of, of, of racism in between groups, but ultimately holds one uh, dominant narrative and one dominant group um, um, in the power. This is the power that not only controls the hospitals, as Ima just said, that are racist, but also the mainstream media, big corporations, our governments, our policies, and ultimately our bodies. Um, the power that ever since colonialism has violently silenced everyone who will dare to speak up the truth and counter the norm. 
So like our colleagues today, this is the power in anti-Blackness, in anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant anti policies as well. And it's a mask of silence that is often present in feminist circles, gender equality circles, and in our organizations. So um, we really wanted to talk to you about this epistemic privilege that uh, it's, it's very important for us to interrogate within our own organizations and ultimately to, about, and ourselves as well in our own practices and how we are helping uh, also one another to, to get rid of, of um, those internalized issues. So Vera will continue taking the next slide, please. Yeah, thank you, Bruna. So uh, yeah, this this um, is what, what has brought us here today is uh, our experiences working in the development sector and uh, realizing that what they call the white gaze continues to be a huge problem. And by this, as Bruna said, it's not white people, but it's really just a system that is found it, it is just a legacy of colonialism, um, of how Northern whiteness and decision-making, uh, especially in the development sector, continues to dictate how uh, the global, how the global South is dealt with. Um, and also the recognition that this is, of course, I think uh, for me specifically, uh, real, realizing this was a, was a huge shock. Uh, uh, Bruna and I went to a very progressive institution, um, the International Institute of Social Studies, and we continued to face and see that structural racism can, was still perpetuated in these spaces. Um, and so today, we, what we really wanted to do was try to unpack this and really think critically about how knowledge is produced. And not just that, but how is decision making done? What are the power relations that exist between experts and local people. What makes you an expert? You know, um, I was once told that uh, if in the Netherlands, when I was there, that if uh, a Dutch person went to India uh, for six months and came back, they would be considered, you know, an expert in the and be hired before I would, because it would just be easier to have uh, a white Dutch person working within the Asian context than trying to jump through the loops to hire me. Um, and so really kind of also like unpacking what it is, this, this, this idea of what being an expert is, but also in terms of how we conduct research and looking at transparency and accountability um, for the kind of work that we do. How do we, how is the research shared back into the communities that we work with? And most importantly, I think the language and the discourse that we use within the development sector and how it removes agency, it can place people back into this space of victimization. Um, and, you know, even today we see that organizations fall into the same trap of development porn, as they say, uh, and really uh, perpetuating white saviorism. Um, so really, you know, I think uh, Chimamanda in her speech says uh, in a talk of uh, not a single story, um, it's like when you perpetuate and you have the same narrative repeated over and over to you, then that's what people become, you know, and so how do we also unpack that? How do we, how is the language that we use, the images that we use, the, the kind of um, communication material that we have? How is that actually bringing agency to the people that we work with? Um, again, you know, um, look, dismantling all whiteness and um, the white patriarchy capitalist structure that we all work in isn't isn't like blaming it's not a black and white issue it's not blaming white people and pitting black people against white people but really how do women of color also internalize this um as an indian woman we i know for a fact that there is so much anti-blackness even within our communities and it's it's so normalized in so many ways and also like we come from a five thousand year old caste system and i think that's really brought up uh, a lot more conversations around how in feminism, even in the stage of, let's look at it intersectionally. Yes, let's like, get voices from the global South, but are we representing Dalit voices from the global South? How has Indian feminism been co-opted by the Brahmin caste, for example? So uh, really when we look at intersectionality and power, really trying to uh, pushing ourselves to think critically about, are we talking about the subaltern? How, are we looking at, taking a feminist standpoint from where the subaltern speaks and who is the subaltern in these spaces. Um, so ultimately today, what we, what we really, really want to do with you is 
kind of open up the space to have these conversations, uh, introspect, interrogate, reflect, and like really find a, a space where we could learn from each other. And, and because we're all practitioners and researchers who are trying to make a, the world a better place and more equitable, I think it really re requires us to reflect even further today. Uh, so I really invite you to join our conversation um, and uh, I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you both so much. Thank you both so much for that presentation. I really, there's a lot here. We have a lot to do. And when I say a lot, I mean all 134 of us here. All right, our next presenter, I'm, I feel like I'm rushing through, but I want to make sure to give time for conversation for everybody to kind of have their own breakthroughs. Solange, the floor is yours. Thank you, Trisha. Uh, firstly, I apologize for my camera because my connection is a bit unstable today and I want, I want this to be as smooth as possible. So in uh, my presentation, I will speak about intersectionality and feminism. Um, first, I'll briefly um, introduce a, a theoretical concept created by Crenshaw. Can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Then I'll explain uh, the lack of inclusion of white feminism and why it is harmful for women of color, but also for the actual fight against the system of oppression. And um, then I'll uh, I'll have, if I have time, I'll share a few recommendations on how to implement um, an interse intersectional approach on an individual level, but also in our your organization. Next slide, please. So the concept was created by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, an American lawyer and a civil rights advocate. She created the, this concept as a legal tool to frame the specific experience of Black women. Black women can face at least two discrimination in their life, sexism and racism, but the judicial system did not make it possible to understand the specific aspect of their discrimination. In the face of the law, Black women needed to choose whether they were discriminated against on the basis of gender or on the basis of race, which doesn't make any sense because they are both at the same time. One day they cannot choose to be woman and the other day they uh, be a black person. Next slide, please. Uh, so what Crenshaw showed with uh, her concept is the intertwining aspect of discrimination, the interconnected nature of social categorization, such as race, class, gender, etc., creates an overlapping or interdependent system of discrimination. A black woman may experience misogyny and racism, but she will experience misogyny differently from a black woman and racism differently from a black man. Um, and today the concept also includes other markers of identity such as sexual orientation, class, migration status, ableism, etc. Next slide, please. Next slide. So um, what I want you to um, pay attention in this presentation is that intersectionality is not a label you own, especially if you are a white organization and it's not some, something trendy. You can put all over your social media to look cool and inclusive. And it's not an opinion either. You cannot agree or disagree with intersectionality. It's just a fact all women or all men or all queer people do not face the same discrimination. So what intersectionality is then? Intersectionality is primarily a tool to look at how uh, social problem and system of oppression intersect and how they differently impact people. Next slide, please. Um, now I'll briefly explain the problem with uh, white feminism. Next slide. 
um, next slide again, please. So um, white feminism is a very specific approach and strategy toward achieving gender equality that focuses more on an individual liberation. And the problem with white feminism is that it's solely, it's solely based on the experience of white middle-class able cis straight women. And then it cannot be transformative because it only um, impacts a small proportion of the people with the demand that it brings at the table. So without an intersectional lens, our effort to tackle oppression toward women and other minorities are likely to just end up perpetrating system of inequalities. Um, yeah, next slide. And next slide again. Again, please. Yeah, so now I'll give some brief um, recommendation on how to implement an intersectional approach in your individual life and also in your organization. As on an individual level, I would say um, you should stop claiming intersectionality as a title to look good on social media, especially when you don't do the work. And then also check your privilege. We are all privileged on, on some level um, from other people. Even as a black woman, I, I am able, I'm educated. So I have some privilege older toward other people. And also, if you want to be intersectional, you need to be ready to feel uncomfortable when your friends or colleagues are calling you out on some things you said you did. It's not about you. You need to disenter yourself from the conversation and really listen to what people have to say to you. And um, one thing I also want to make loud, especially to uh, white people, is do not apologize for your identity. It does not help anyone to say, I'm sorry for being white. The thing is to do the work, an active work. And um, next thing is do not speak for us. Let us speak for ourselves, just give us the space to do so. And lastly, and I think it's an important point, is allyship is not um, a pin to show people, yeah, I have, I'm, I'm an ally. Allyship is doing the work, doing an active work in dismantling the system of oppression. And uh, next slide, on uh, an organizational level, First thing is do not call yourself a safe space. You don't have the power to do so. How you perceive yourself is different than how people feel in your space. Um, another thing is you need to question the internal dynamics of your organization. Um, having people of color in your organization does not make you um, an, inter an intersectional and safe space automatically. You need to look at where you put the people of color or the disabled people. Are you really intersectional when all the lower paid jobs are given to black and brown people and all the position of power are held by white people? So it's more of where like the position of people then how many they are and um yeah the thing i want to say is having the diversity is not enough to call you to call yourself a safe place you need to see where the diversity is it's really um this um these specific things that where are they not only in the small paying job. And um, yeah, we can discuss it after in the 
breakthrough rooms and I would be happy to have you and to talk about everything I said. Solange, that was incredible. That is what you call speaking truth to power. I am so proud of this panel. I really am. That, that was, if I could take off my arms and throw them, I would. That was amazing. And our last but not least presenter is somebody that I see at least three times a week, right? <laughs> In meetings. Um, and is always pushing the issue of structural analysis and intersectionality. And she has made huge inroads for the Generation Equality Forum, which was no easy task. I say that because I want you to know um, the kind of work that she does and the perspective that she comes from. This is structural analysis and then there's structural analysis. So to that end, Castania, the floor is absolutely yours. Thank you. Thank you, Trisha, for this introduction. And well, just speaking after everything that we heard, I'm really um, amazed by this yeah by the powerful presentations and yeah so um for me feminism is really also um anti-racism work and at least if it's intersectional um but what does that actually mean and we also had this conversation um being taking up a space in the anti in this anti-racism space and having the conversation as as a white person um, is, is that something we should do? And um, the conclusion is yes, because of course, anti-racism work is work that white people need to do because we are part of this racist system and we need to dismantle it and we need to challenge um, ourselves individually and analyze our unconscious biases, everything how we internalize racist structures. So um, in the conversations in the breakouts uh, that we want to uh, have is really, um, and we heard this before, is really, and started it already, is really leaning into these uncomfortable and painful conversations. Because when we start to take a look, I think maybe what's, what's important to, um, to talk about, as Trisha said in her introduction, is moving from the individual that I am not a racist is something that we heard that we hear a lot um, because I'm I'm speaking up against it or I'm like of course I'm not like being I don't see myself as a racist person that's something that we hear a lot but um, really taking a look at the structural level at white privileges um, and being becoming aware that even though um, you are not a racist person, you are part of a racist system. And that, um, that is how you are automatically benefiting from, or we are benefiting um, as a white person from, from privileges. And privileges and discrimination really are two coins, uh, two sides of the same coin. And um, understanding it's not something that you choose to have, but that, is, that just exists. So just moving into the uh, in, into this work where you see where you start seeing um, the privileges that we have as a white person and that um, and the discriminations that other people face um, and we are we, and taking a look at that and um, I think it's it is an uncomfortable and difficult and sometimes painful work because starting to move through it and realizing how we are part um, of oppressive structures as well. I think, especially in the feminist movement, we see a lot of, we, we work to, we work for equality and we um, challenge structures and we challenge systems of oppression and power. But we sometimes forget being like part of, of this work where we feel we are the oppressed ones that we sometimes don't realize as white people, how we um, perpetuate and uphold systems of oppression within our own structures. So really taking a look at how do we, when we talk about the systemic approach to um, changing systems of oppressions and inequality and how these different levels really um, are interlinked. So if we, if we want to change this uh, systems of oppression, we need to change the racism and the structures of oppression, oppression within our institutions, our organizations, 
And of course, these organizations and institutions consist of individuals. So uh, we need to do the individual work. And that's in the, in the uh, breakout room that I really want, to, um, want us to talk about and have a conversation around how are we um, addressing our own internalized racism, our own internalized white supremacy. And um, uh, yeah, and, and challenge ourselves to work through that, to see, start seeing it and um, challenge it. And I think, um, let's go into the conversations so that we have enough time to do the work there. <laughs> I, yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I just would like to add a few points. I know I'm not a panelist, but I'm gonna pretend I'm one for the next two minutes. And um, I find that, and I wanna just frame this so that it, these are all, again, this is complex, but you need to start thinking about it to Isma's point in the chat, to what Ksenia said, to Solange's incredible presentation, Rita Bruna, nobody here, I would hope not, would say I'm a racist, right? Obviously, if they're here, they are either trying to work through it or don't perceive themselves that way. So if all of us in gender equality are perceiving ourselves that way, what are the outcomes? So it's not so much about the intention. The outcomes are, like Isma said, there is medical racism. What, I mean, it, it's just, it's in every structure. And I can tell you in full candor in this field, those of us who are concerned with intersectionality, we have a meeting and then we have a meeting after to deconstruct what's happened and how it fell short of what it was that we intended to do on paper. And so who are we actually comparing ourselves to? And I would offer that the gender equality space more likely than not compares themselves to the outside world. And compared to those structures, it's a progressive space and they feel like that's okay. I'm asking you to do two different things in these, in these breakout groups or breakthrough groups. One is change your measuring stick. Your measuring stick should more than likely be the voices of the people of color that are saying that this is actually not working out. And it should be an anti-racist ideal rather than comparing yourself to society at large. And that's where we're falling short. We're comparing ourselves to them. They're not progressive. They're not this, they're not that. So by comparison, we always look better as a field. But people underneath that umbrella that are black and brown are feeling left out, excluded, humiliated is a word I, I get a lot, all of those kinds of things working in this space. And if you're comfortable with that, then this session is not for you. If you are not comfortable with that, then I would urge you to probably in the breakthrough um, sessions, start to think about what is your measuring stick and does that need to change? Believe black and brown people when they say they don't feel comfortable. Secondly, um, the challenges that you give yourself, they don't have to be huge where you have like an anti-xenophobic, um, uh, protest of 60,000 people in the middle of, you know, Belgium somewhere. That's, that's not, you know, those, those are not the actions that we're hoping that people talk about because those are not as realistic. It's, those are very visible and those, those are great, but it's the daily microaggressions, the little pinpricks, the little slight things that you can do, but I want you to be microaggressive to racism. So for example, when you are citing something about Let's say, say for sake of argument, anything having to do with gender equality, try to cite women of color. Use them as the canon. When you have the opportunity, when something happens in your space and you know it's racist and then you go and you talk to your friend after it's happened, that serves no purpose. You need to speak up at the time. The person that's going through this doesn't need the additional burden of then having to defend themselves while everybody's quiet but supportive and private. We need to speak up that use your privilege in that way. And to speaking up, you also sometimes need to step back. Who's on these panels? Some people are on, it seems a panel every 30, 40 minutes. And I don't mean here at NGOCSW, I'm just talking about in general, in the gender equality field, we've seen these people, we know who they are. And in some cases they do bear knowledge that nobody else has. But if it's something where you're putting together a panel take that opportunity because that in itself is a privilege and take that opportunity to put together a panel with people who don't normally have the opportunity, but certainly have the knowledge and probably way and above the person that is always on, on the panel that is a white woman. Step back a little. Also, um, one other thing that I would, I would 
mention, and I think this has been mentioned in the chat as well, hiring people of color is great, but saying, you know, this is a fertile ground for, for people of color, and then we pour water and it rains and we have fertilizer, but it's sand. Everybody, and you're not feeling comfortable and it's, and it's awkward and your voice is not heard and you're doing, you know, all kinds of things that if you were not a, a person of color that you wouldn't be asked to do and all kinds of little microaggressions. They're not always on purpose, but what you can purposely do, you're not expected to know everything. That's not fair. But what you can do is sit back and listen. And when it happens, consider it valid. Your default is, this can't be because I don't see it. Try, and this is hard, I know, but let the default be, I don't see it. That's a deficiency within me that I need to change because all these black, brown and black, we don't have a secret group all over the world. Where we tell a bunch of lies. We're all telling the same story and we don't know each other. So this is not a big conspiracy. These things are actually happening. So I'm really glad that you're here. Um, some of the intersecting and inequalities, we would have had a panel of 96 people if we could, but I'm hoping that you bring them up in the breakthrough groups. There's, there's disabled women, there's indigenous women, there's um, queer people, there's all kinds of inequalities that we did not get a chance to address here that intersect with racism. Please bring those up in the, in the breakthrough groups. And again, your task is simple but complicated come up with one goal that you can change within yourself, something small, like I said, like citing, you know, brown women um, or, and or your organization. Okay, I'm looking at my organization now. I see that everybody of color, they're there, but they're only there for about a year and a year and a half. They leave and they leave in a huff. This, you know, something clearly is wrong, even though I don't see it. What can I do? And you may not have the right answer, but there is no right answer. The right answer is to try. So with that being said, we can break through, if we can, Devin, and split into groups. And we will have about 20 minutes to discuss that. And you'll be led by uh, one or several of us. And then we'll come back to the center, talk about it, answer questions, and then close. Any questions on how we are structuring this? Claire? OK, great. All right, so you should be getting a breakout prompt shortly. Please join your group and have fun. And any questions, please put them in the chat. Thank you. Ah, oh, there is everybody. Okay. Awesome. Great. All right, so yes, Natalie, it always is quicker than you expect. It's funny when you're waiting for something at like the bank or the supermarket, 20 minutes seems like a year, but not when you're having these types of conversations. And so if you would like to share your personal and your organizational um, tenant or action plan or goal, um, we'd love to hear it. And I see uh, Tondo has raised their hand. So Tondo, floor is yours. Um, so we obviously didn't have uh, enough time to for everyone to discuss um, an action plan, but Laura Martinez said something that I think is really powerful, which is that we need to take action even in the most casual moments. So when someone says something that could be considered a microaggression and um, it's just totally inappropriate and uncomfortable, whether it's in a social gathering or 
you know, uh, it's important for you to take action to not allow that. But I think more than that, Trisha, we haven't um, unpacked the issue of albinism and the experiences of internalized racism that they face in communities of color. And I hope that um, one day or at some point we'll also unpack that a great deal. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And um, not to plug the next session, but we're doing an anti-racism workshop. This is just a little dip of the toe, but we're doing a full workshop tomorrow. And it's clear to me that this needs to be a longer conversation. So I will be in touch with all of you probably within the next two weeks so that we can start to make this a thing, right? All right, Carlos, the floor is yours. Thank you. I actually wanted to congratulate everyone here and congratulate Tricia, congratulate the speakers because this event is so powerful, it's so amazing. And the importance that it has is that we actually are talking about taboo topics that not many people are that want to talk about because they feel uncomfortable with it. And right now we have a safe space to do so. We nobody feeling, oh, you're attacking me or no, but I'm not, it's not like that. No, this is a safe place for everyone to debate, to have their opinion. And everyone is just, you know, uh, having a good time talking about real serious topics. And when I was in the breakthrough group uh, room, it was so amazing. It was literally on fire while we're talking up there. We talk about like literally everything from the last 200 years to today. And one of the things that must uh, impressed me of one of the uh, women that were there, I don't remember the name. It, it was that she was like, what we can do, what are the tools to go against and, uh, racism? What are people, what organizations, what, what, what movements uh, are doing to actually create tools to go against racism? And we were, when we were talking about that, she was like, you know, this is the first time I am in an in a event where they are talking of, um, of anti-racism, where they are talking about intersectionality. And it was in a, we were talking there and she was like, we were like, well, actually that's because in every event of anti-racism or racism that there is, we always talk in a general basis. We always talk about racism in general, but actually racism has so many topics and issues, has so many things that we can talk about that just one session is not enough to talk about it. And that's the, that's the problem, that how if we have so many things that we haven't talked about it, how can we go to talk about creating tools against racism if we haven't talked about uh, the whole racism uh, system? Uh, you know, we just talk about it in a general basis and not in a specific topics. So, I will try just to say um, my thoughts and opinion is that we need to create more events like this. We need to create more events based on racism on every topic. We need people to listen, but not just to listen, to actually make something. This needs okay. to be proactive. It needs to be resilient. People mm -hmm. here need to go out after this event and say, you know, I was in an event and we can do this, we can do that. Like be proactive, be resilient. And Carlos, I'm yes. so sorry, but we are running out of time and I just want to make sure we get to Jennifer. I thought we'd have more time, but it's time is, and I hate to cut people off, I apologize, but I'm going to move to Jennifer and then we're going to have to close. I'm going to have the uh, chair of NGO CSW close this out and we can continue this conversation tomorrow. There's a part two. Jennifer, the floor is yours. You're the last word. Thank you. I'll, I will try to make it worthwhile working within my community to fight racism from the inside out. Uh, I am a co-chair for a high school alumni association. And while that might not seem like a big deal, uh, we are a small but mighty group who is promoting change within the entire state of California. I want to disseminate that change across the nation by addressing the non-literature and policies that do not speak to racism on, the be on behalf of protected status. We have a lot of policies around bullying or workplace discrimination, but we do not have educational policies that protect our children, teachers, and their families on behalf of their protected status. So the Whitney High School Black Alumni Association are fighting for those changes. We are working in tandem with our superintendent, as well as the school board within our school district and at a state level to now leverage 
the recently approved ethnic studies curriculum as a framework for how we will create and build more conscious classrooms and increase the aptitude um, that we have as community members about other persons protected status. And so we can be a better nation, build better global citizens and fight racism from the inside out. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And I, again, apologize. I thought we'd have more time. It just got away from us, but I urge you all to come to the session tomorrow. That is a workshop on anti-racism that will give you actual tools to explore further on the goals and the organizational um, uh, breaking down those structures. So with that said, I'm going to hand it over to the chair of NGOCSW, Puri Kurulekin, to close us out. And I will see you guys all tomorrow. And thank you to our panelists. Puri, floor is yours. Trisha, you can have the floor at the end. I don't want to close this out, but I'm so, so grateful for you to give me this the, the space to just share how grateful I am and how honored I am to be in a space such as this. And then I'm so glad that Jennifer was the last chair because what Jennifer was saying, and also we had an Iranian in our group, Simin, who was saying the same thing. We have to be very aware of the local to the global and global to the local, right? Just like Jennifer is doing it locally. And Simin was talking about how she was changing her family's attitudes by arguing over the dinner table and changing their thoughts. Those are all important. And of course, here we are at the global level. I wanna also just touch upon, because I know we, I have some sisters in this, um, in this uh, meeting from the historic NGO CSW, let's say, we've been around for a long time. And it's not the first time we're dealing with anti-racism. I wanna be clear of that, but it's the first time we're integrating it, integrating it into the full, spectrum like the whole intersectionality of it we've had um you know african and women descent and we've had we've we've addressed this in small committees or in small events but what i'm so proud of and i'm so grateful for trisha to take the helm on this and just run with it is that we are now for the first time saying that it's not marginalized it is part of the whole conversation and that, you know, because every time we talk at the UN level, right, every time we talk about, for example, early marriage or child rights, somebody comes up and says, what about older women? We know there's a lot of different topics that we need to address and we're always being challenged. You're not addressing climate, you're not addressing this. We try to bring everything together. But what we're saying and what we're doing is that anti-racism is one of them, even if UN does not wanna deal with it, we are going to deal with it. So I thank you all for being here, for sharing all of this and please stand by us. Please, I, I put it in the chat. Well, let, first, let me just say that come, come and join us for our, on our journey for this experiment of collaborative shared leadership to see if we can uplift each other because final word, I'm gonna say it again, nobody is free until everybody is free. I know I keep saying this, but I'm just so honored to, um, to be here. And that's of, of course, Fannie Lou Hamer. Thank you again, Trisha, for everything that you're doing. Thank you all so much for taking the first step in this journey. Tomorrow is the anti-racism workshop. It's 4 to 5.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, which is New York time. And um, we will dig even deeper into the structural and you will walk out with some tools to not only come up with a plan for today, but moving forward because the work really never ends but the work is not effective without this work. So thank you for taking this journey with me. I'd like to especially thank my wonderful panelists. I mean, this was fun guys, it really was. Um, Isma, Bruna, Vita, Solange, Ksenia, thank you for taking this crazy little journey with me. And I hope to see most of you tomorrow. Thank you very, very much for your open minds and open hearts and have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye everyone.